On the 6th of May, which as of recording is tomorrow, Charles III will be crowned King of the United Kingdom and the Commonwealth Nations. This follows the death of his mother, Queen Elizabeth II, last year. Now, Queen Elizabeth II had a famous namesake who was queen before her several centuries before, and that is of course Queen Elizabeth I. However, in this video, I'd like to look at Charles and his various namesakes, because Charles will be Charles III of the United Kingdom, but there are actually two Charleses before him, and I thought it might be quite nice in this video to take a quick look at their reigns and what if anything, we can expect from the third Charles. Charles III has two namesakes in the past, which obviously are Charles I and Charles II. Now, Charles I ruled from 1625 to 1649. Charles II, his son, ruled from 1660 to 1685. And of course, Charles III will rule from 2023 and we don't know until exactly when. So let's start off with the name Charles itself. The etymology of Charles actually comes from an old English word that simply meant man. It's also found in the word churl, although that obviously has more boorish connotations than the more royal sounding Charles. And its Germanic cognate in many Germanic languages is something like the German Karl, found in the English name Karl still, or in the Dutch Karl. And actually what's interesting is that this element of Charles meaning man is also found in names like Charlemagne, which is simply Charles the Great, Charles le Magne, which is found together in that name. However, the first Charles that we find in English history of any particular note as a monarch is Charles I. And Charles I started off his reign in 1625, but he was born in 1600 at the same time that England was still ruled by Elizabeth I. So there's a nice bit of symmetry there in the first place. However, he was not the son of Elizabeth I, who was famously a virgin queen. Elizabeth would die in 1603, and it's at that point that the father of the future Charles I, James VI of Scotland, would become James I of England, while still continuing to rule Scotland, as he was Elizabeth's first cousin twice removed, and so in line to the throne. So Charles I spent his early childhood up in Scotland, but was then moved down to England. Now in 1625, when his father died, Charles became Charles I of England and Scotland. Charles's reign is famous for several things, but most importantly for his disagreements with Parliament and how this led to civil war. There was already unrest in his reign as he had decided to marry a Catholic, Henrietta Maria, who was French, and obviously in England at the time there were a lot of Protestants, and some hardcore puritanical Protestants. In Scotland, there were also many Presbyterians, which also formed a more hardcore element of Protestantism, and there was a lot of suspicion around popery or Catholicism. This would come to a head in 1639, as Charles espoused that it was his divine right as the king to choose the bishops, an Episcopalian form of the church. However, this, many, this rubbed many of the Scots the wrong way, who had signed an act of covenant in which they believed that the covenant was between themselves and God, the congregation and God himself, and that the congregation were responsible, the church was responsible for choosing the bishop and not the king. This led to the Bishops' War, with the Scots invading Northern England. Now, Charles needed money to raise armies to fight against them, and so in 1640 he would call upon Parliament to sit, and basically just wanted Parliament to agree to his raising taxes so that he could pay for this. However, this would go disastrously wrong for Charles, they would not agree to it at all, and he would dissolve the Parliament, which became known as the Short Parliament. However, in a following parliament that was called up, known to history as the Long Parliament, Parliament passed a very important act in which it was made unlawful for the parliament to be dissolved without the agreement of the members of that parliament, meaning the king could no longer dismiss parliament. And this parliament would actually last for a whole two decades because of the act that was called. Charles would try and arrest the members involved in the passing of this act, but they escaped before he managed to get to Parliament. This set off a long line of events that would culminate in 1642 with the English Civil War. 
often also called the War of the Three Kingdoms, that is, as it expanded well beyond England into Wales, into Scotland, and into Ireland, as well as onto the seas around the uh, England and Ireland and across the into the New World in America too. Essentially, an army of Parliament would fight against those loyal to the King, the Parliamentarians against the Royalists. Eventually, Charles would be beaten in multiple important engagements, leading to his having to flee away, although he was captured by the Parliamentarians in 1647. He did manage to escape, but two years later, he was captured again, this time by the Scots, who, after lengthy negotiations, handed him over to Parliament. Parliament held a very long trial, the first time in which a king had been put on trial by his own Parliament, and found him guilty and executed him at Whitehall, the first and so far only act of regicide in English history. However, the royalist cause wasn't completely lost, because Charles had a son who he also called Charles. And this Charles in 1649, after a long series of negotiations, was declared the King of Scotland, although he had to make several compromises to do this, such as saying that Presbyterianism would become the religion of all three kingdoms of England, Scotland and Ireland. However, in 1651, and following a lot of shenanigans in Scotland, Charles would try to invade England and to then retake the throne of his father. This led to the Battle of Worcester, in which Parliament's new model army absolutely wiped the floor with Charles's ragtag band of Scots and Loyalist Royalists, which is actually a fun way of saying it, who fought against Cromwell and the Parliament. Charles would have to flee away, and despite being over six foot and several thousands of pounds being issued as a reward for his capture, he managed to escape first to the Netherlands and later to the Spanish Netherlands, and there lived in exile. Now, the parliamentarians did not elect a new king at this point, and instead it was Oliver Cromwell, a leading general who would declare himself the Lord Protector of England, Scotland, and Ireland. He was therefore not a king, and this period is called the Interregnum, the period between kings, a time in which England would for a short period be a republic, something which was um, had already been done, of course, in the Dutch Republic, but which was very radical and very new. England would follow a hardcore version of Protestantism, Puritanism, in which many fun things like Christmas and wassailing and the theatre would be banned. However, in many ways, Cromwell did act like a typical English king, following the most English pastime of going up and having a good kick around with the Scots and particularly the Irish, where he has a particularly black reputation for acts that bordered on what we would call today genocide. However, he would kick the bucket in 1658, and although he was followed up by his son Richard, Richard was not the statesman that his father was. And so, two years later, in 1660, the English recalled Charles's son, who was in exile in the Netherlands, from the Dutch Republic and returned him to England and the English throne, in what becomes known as the Restoration, because it restored the English monarchy that had been dormant since Cromwell was on the throne. However, to do this, he would have to sign the Declaration of Breda, in which he promised not to rule in the same absolutist way that his father Charles I had done with his particularly poor relationship with Parliament. It would also mean that there had to be more religious freedom in England, even if some of these things were overturned slightly later on in Charles's reign. Charles would be most famously remembered as being a bit of a party king, something that almost every Every British history student will have come across thanks to horrible histories. My name is, my name is, my name is Charles II. I'm the king who brought back partying. As well as being a top lad, Charles would try and get the English merchants back onto the global scene and deal with key competition. Unfortunately for him, that key competition was the Dutch Republic just across the channel. And in 1665, he started, well not him personally, but the English started the second Second Anglo-Dutch Sea War against the Dutch. Unfortunately for him, however, the Dutch would be far too difficult to defeat, and the Dutch were able to inflict several heavy defeats 
on the English Navy before peace was signed. This didn't deter Charles, however, and he soon found himself dealing with the French in an attempt to blunt Dutch naval ambitions, leading to the Third Anglo-Dutch Sea War in 1672, when the joint English and French navies would team up to fight against the Dutch at sea, whilst the French would invade the Netherlands by land, followed by a host of German states as well, all at once, in an attempt to crush the Dutch for once and for all. Unfortunately for the English and French at sea, the amazing genius of the Dutch Admiral Admiral Michiel de Ruyter would prove to be too difficult and he would inflict many defeats on the English and French navies before unfortunately himself being killed. However, these efforts would secure the existence of the Dutch Republic and following several years of heavy fighting, French forces were also forced to pull out of the Dutch Republic, leaving it in a much stronger position than before and Charles's ambitions thwarted. As a result of some of these negotiations with the French in order to team up with the Dutch, Charles promised that he would convert to Catholicism. There were several other plots such as that of Titus Oates, which were linked to popist plots, as they were called at the time, and there was a constant fear that either Charles would himself become a Catholic or would be killed by a Catholic and a Catholic would come to the throne. Even though we don't know what the exact religious conviction of Charles himself was, we do know that his brother, James Duke of York, was himself a Catholic. And that's another interesting Dutch connection because it's during that Anglo-Dutch sea war that he sails into New Amsterdam and because he was the Duke of York, it gets renamed to New York. Now this James would go on to be the next ruler of the United Kingdom, which actually didn't exist yet, so that's England and Scotland and Ireland. However, he would be removed from the throne by another Dutchman because the English were unhappy with having a Catholic on the throne. And this Dutchman was none other than William III, William of Orange, as he's often called in English. And this would occur in 1688 with the Glorious Revolution, when the Dutch invaded England and removed James from the throne. However, that of course is after the reign of Charles II, and Charles dies in 1685, leaving the throne obviously to his brother James, which is when we get those results. He's mostly remembered then as the Merry Monarch. He had some shenanigans fighting against the Dutch and allying with the French, some slightly suspicious Catholic behaviour, but all round he is remembered more positively than his father Charles I. How then will we remember Charles III? Well, that's a very difficult question to answer, of course, because he will be officially crowned tomorrow. Many things have changed since the 17th century. The kings have a lot less of a say, and that may be for the best, having uh, said what I have in this video about what the various Charleses have done. However, I think based on his namesakes in history, we should be aware that if Charles starts messing around with the Scots, and changing parliament, maybe we should get a little bit worried about what he's up to. Although, based on my calculations in this video, I think that by 2030, we will probably have another Dutchman on the British throne. Anyway guys, just a bit of a joke to close out with there, but I do wish the new incoming King Charles III all the best, and I hope that his reign will be less eventful, uh, certainly than Charles I's reign, and um, I, I, I do hope we won't see any more Anglo-Dutch sea wars occurring, but I, I or as I said, the 17th century is a, is a while ago now, and uh, things have changed quite a bit in that time. Uh, probably for the best, I, I would imagine. Anyway, thank you very much for sticking with me. Sorry that the uploads have been um, pretty all over the place lately. There was, unfortunately, some uh, some things that were going on. Uh, but we are back again, rocking and rolling. So we'll have uh, regular uploads coming up again. Got some good stuff on some football histories as well as per popular request. And I'll have some more flag videos and other things to look forward to as well. So thank you all so much for watching and for sticking with me. Let me know what you thought in the comments below and I will see you all very soon. Anyway, long live the king.